Thank you and good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar today. This webinar is sponsored by the Regional Education Educational Laboratory Program, which is part of the U.S. Department of Education Institute of Education Sciences. The REL, uh, there are 10 of those across the country, and they provide regional support for applied research and evaluation. They also provide technical support and information sharing to build capacity to use data for improved education outcomes. You can see on the map um, in front of you the different areas that are covered by the 10 RELs across the country. The mission of REL Appalachia is to meet the applied research and technical support needs of Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia. We bring evidence-based information to policymakers and practitioners. And the way that we do that is by providing support for a more evident, reliant education system, informing policy and practice for states, districts, schools, and other stakeholders, and focus on high-priority, discrete issues building a body of knowledge over time. We work through what we call research alliances, and research alliances are partnerships between education stakeholders and REL Appalachia. The purpose of an alliance is where is that the partners, um, REL Appalachia and the alliance members, develop and carry out a research and analytic technical assistance agenda on priority topics. Those topics include ones like we are, we'll be talking about today around improving mathematical problem solving in grades four through eight. The stakeholders for each alliance include representatives from one or more schools, divisions, state education agencies, and other organizations. The goal for today's webinar, the goal for today's webinar to understand the importance of incorporating mathematical problem solving in daily instruction, learning about the links between the NCTM's five process standards, the common core standards for mathematical practices, and the Virginia standards of learning, and also to describe the research base for the standards and illustrate how they can be put into practice in the middle grade. If you have questions or would like to talk to us at REL Appalachia, you can see our website here, also our Twitter address and an email address. We are happy to um, discuss any topics with you and um, answer any questions that you might have. So without further delay, I would like to introduce our speaker today, John Woodward. Uh, from the School of Education at the University of Puget Sound. He's the dean there. He's also an author of the practice guide, Improving Mathematical Problem Solving in Grades 4 through 8. Um, we have had the opportunity to work with Dr. Woodward at Bridge Events and also on other webinars, and I can assure you that you are in for a very interesting hour. You will learn a lot about improving mathematical problem solving skills, and at this point, I would like to turn it over and thank Dr. Woodward. Thank you, Ladada. Um, and I don't want to scare him away, but I'm going to warn you that you may have to solve a problem in the remaining time that we have. Uh, if things go well at your end, we'll be crunched for time. You won't have to solve it. but. Be prepared, pencil in hand, we're going to uh, actually work through an example just to kind of prove a point. The first thing I want to get to is obviously why is problem solving important for today's math classrooms? This is not a new question. Uh, in fact, being an old question, it reminds us of the fact that this thing hasn't, be resol hasn't been resolved, at least in terms of daily practice. What this slide communicates is, in an incredibly short way, a lot of the information that's captured in uh, the problem solving guide for grades four through eight that Ladata referred to. We're going to come back to that again shortly, but we spent a considerable amount of time in that practice guide trying to make apparent to you know teachers, administrators, math coaches, uh, you name it, the importance of problem solving in today's world. And you can look at it from multiple perspectives. When you do see problem solving occurring in classrooms, 
Unfortunately, it often occurs in the form of independent seat work where teachers then just go over the answers and move on to the next portion of the lesson. It's assigned as homework or it becomes, and this is where the end of chapter is in uh, quotation marks, it's the kind of thing where if it's multiplication, they're given word problems, it's pretty well apparent that these are multiplication problems that are structured in the curriculum for, for uh, students to go through. So it doesn't put a lot of demands on teachers. It uh, also, at the same time, doesn't develop the kind of problem-solving skills that are found in successful countries, uh, in at least as measured by TIMS and PISA, in other places of the world. As the slide indicates, Singapore has made problem-solving the central component of their whole mathematics curriculum. And I was uh, fortunate just a couple weeks ago, I was in Japan at a conference uh, where part of it, they, we, it's a matter of talking about different teaching practices in both countries. It's been going on for 25 years, and one of the central sessions of the entire conference was on lesson study, something you've probably all heard about. And lesson study is designed to, in the case of mathematics, uh, mathematical practices, make problem solving the central piece of an entire lesson. So in contrast to what's in the bullet up above, it's not pushed off to homework or just independent seat practice. It's the kind of thing that involves preparation, prompting, dialogue, all the things that are going to get covered in the problem-solving guides that I'm going to be uh, alluding to in the second half of this presentation. Of course, the last thing that makes problem-solving important is that, you know, we used to live in a world where we search for data, and now we live in a sea of data. In fact, I was reminded, and I talked to my undergraduates about this, there are two incredibly important characteristics today that employers are working for, looking for. One of them is communication, uh, oral and written capacities, but the other one is to be able to take data, make sense of it, and communicate it to others. So that in itself is an incredibly important justification for problem solving, and it's most unfortunate if that kind of experience isn't developed till college or even afterwards in the world of work. So lots of reasons to think about problem solving, and the challenge is to somehow institutionalize more of it in classrooms. When I put the panel together for the IES, one of the panel members, Mark Driscoll, who's at the Education Development Corporation, probably said it better than anything else, and we can all you know, appreciate this given that we've been in our own respective states and seen the standards develop since the 1990s. One of the functional effects of standards as they were articulated state by state is when a teacher or administrator looks at standards in the areas of math, most all of what they see is content. And when they look at process, it's the same process repeated again and again. So where the eye, the mind, and the everyday practice seems to be you know, push toward is the issue of content, and content focus alone tends to crowd out problem solving. So in some respects, we're a victim of our own focus almost exclusively at a standards level on content, and we've marginalized the problem solving in, in the process. And this is something that we kind of have to readdress in ways that are going to be, um, you know, to say the very least, uh, uncomfortable for a lot of teachers, but absolutely necessary nonetheless. What I'm going to do in this section of the proposal, and it's really important to say this from the outset, you're going to get a lot of cross-referencing in the next set of slides. And I don't want you to be sidetracked or um, you know, confused by a lot of this. Uh, they've mentioned in the beginning this is being recorded. The slides will be made available to you, so don't get lost in the cross-referencing that you're going to see between the NCTM process standards, the Common Core math pra practice standards, and then, of course, what Virginia has articulated for its math standards of learning. And in fact, there's even going to be more cross-referencing when we get down to the practice guides uh, later in the presentation. So just bear with me over the next set of slides so you see what these linkages are all about, because there's perhaps a propensity on the part of some to say, well, gosh, you know, we're not doing the Common Core in Virginia. What is the relevant of the Common Core state standard mathematical practices? Well, we'll see what the linkages are in the next few slides. So if you start here, and here it is, the National Council of Teacher Mathematics NCTM process standards, the Common Core stuff, and the uh, Virginia uh, standards of learning, here's how they kind of play out. If you look at them, 
you know, from a Venn diagram kind of fashion, you'll see that, and this will be true of the next couple of slides, the linkages between the NCTM process standards and what's in the standards of learning for Virginia are incredibly tight. They're tighter than even the circles kind of indicate in terms of the overlap. The intention, as we will see when we get to the math practice standards for the Common Core, is to draw upon material like the process standards and other material in terms of, of math documents and guides to comprise eight standards that are articulated in a slightly different way. But I think you'll see the linkages are closer than you may have anticipated. So when we get to just the Virginia Standards of Learning and the NCTM process strands, notice really kind of what's been ha and what's been added for the most part to the standards of learning. It's basically been the adjective, the mathematical, okay? Except for reasoning and proof, which is truncated to just reasoning, you essentially have by title pretty close connections between the process strands, strands, excuse me, and the standards of learning. If you take it a step further and start looking at some of the language, and I know that there are differences for sure, and for those who have been involved in the standards of learning in Virginia, I'm sure there have been spirited conversations that tease out slight differences between, say, what the NCTM called for and prescribed and, you know, what was found in the, the state of Virginia. But, you know, my experience is working around the country, for the most part, many, many states simply adopted whole cloth the NCTM standards in the 1990s when they created their standards because it was convenient, it was there, and it was kind of vetted uh, through, you know, a larger scale mathematical organization. But to get back to Virginia's uh, standards, you can see that what's in the NCTM that's not in Virginia is the word persistence, which is an incredibly important word. We tried to actually find research on that, and it was challenging, and maybe that's the reason why it doesn't appear in the Virginia standards. But, you know, slightly different language in terms of reasoning and proof as opposed to mathematical reasoning. You've got inductive and deductive. You've got logical reasoning as opposed to conjectures and evaluating arguments. But from the outsider, especially to the classroom teacher, a lot of this stuff kind of looks the same. And then, of course, you've got identical language when you get down to the issue of representations. Communication, uh, you know, to be clear, to be convincing, to be precise, and this is certainly a theme that's going to appear in the Common Core, uh, you've got expressing things precisely in the Virginia standards and the, especially the use of vocabulary, which is a slightly different twist than what you find in the uh, NCTM. And then connections, it's integrated. You, and, and here's a special case for Virginia where they make explicit the concern of making the connections to science, which you don't find in uh, the NCTM standards, uh, at least as they're, they're written. What you find when you get to the Common Core, so now this is that outer circle in the Venn diagram, they're trying to develop their practices based on processes and proficiencies that have been with math for a long time. And that was, you know, the mega framework they used to develop the different pro uh, practice standards. But they also make it clear in their document that they're going to envelop in the practice standards both the NCTM process standards and then what's found interestingly enough in adding it up. And I think that's fascinating in itself because the uh, National Research Council's book albeit published in 2001, still has a lot of resonance. And you may, you know, for those of you familiar with the book, remember that rope weave that they used in the uh, book that was quite effective in reminding us that proficiency and dispositions and all these things ideally are interwoven together. And, and I think that's one reason why they drew on the Adding It Up book as another framework for thinking about developing their eight uh, practice standards. So here they are, and you know you've probably all seen them. If you haven't, you can access the uh, you know Common Core uh, website, and of course it's right there in the document. Each one of these is fully described and articulated. And so now the question becomes: What's the overlay? What's the connection between these standards, the NCTM standards, and of course transitively down the road, how you connect that to the Virginia State Standards. I'm going to borrow something that Mike Shaughnessy, who is an ex-president of the NCTM, did when he tried to connect the Common Core Standards to the NCTM Standards. I'm doing it slightly differently, connecting it to the Virginia Standards, but the spirit of these connections are exactly the same. 
So when you look at mathematical problem solving for the state of Virginia, you can see that the Common Core Standards 1 and 5 tend to fit. And again, he's done the very similar thing using the NCTM standards. And so 2, 3, and 8 fit relatively well for mathematical reasoning. Now, you know, there are going to be differences, but for the most part, you can draw the connections uh, this way. And I think, you know, as I saw Shaughnessy do it, it was kind of a, uh, an effective way of, of making these kinds of connections. As for representations, communications, connections, it kind of plays out in this fashion. So you model with mathematics to do representations. You do the viable arguments, and that's communication, and you can see the rest. What we want to do is show what this all looks like based on research, how in turn it gets applied, and what ultimately this means for professional development. And this is the next move that I want to make. So again, I want to remind you, the preceding slides, those are materials that you can kind of go back over at another time if you're you know, looking further at how these connections between, say, the Virginia Standards and the Common Core Standards work. The next level is to leap into this stuff. Now. As Ladata mentioned in the beginning, I was the author, actually I was technically the chair of the problem solving guide on the left, and my colleague Russell Gersten was the chair of the RTI guide on the right. Both of these are available for free from the Institute of Education Sciences. You can download them as PDFs. Uh, all you do is do a Google and you can actually use the words that are on this screen. Problem solving guide, probably grades four through eight would, would be good for a search, and then the RTI guide, it'll pop up in your browser and you can download the information. And in terms of translating research into practice, as Ladata suggested, let me just talk about how these guides are constructed. Um, there are any number of them uh, that RTI has, excuse me, that, that uh, the Institute of Education Sciences has funded to this point. A relatively small number, about five of them, are in the area of mathematics, and I'm going to get to a brand new one at the very end of this presentation. But they try and take topics that are of considerable interest and importance in you know, education today. And the way the scheme works, and this is something that I don't think a lot of people understand, it's not one of these blind, whatever the data happens to say, this is what we're going to try and distill in a document. Instead, it's a very careful interplay between recommendations that an expert panel makes and how those recommendations are supported through research. So. What I can talk about, certainly, uh, with the greatest depth is the problem-solving guide on the left. The way this guide was constructed, I was given uh, you know, the opportunity to ask for uh, panelists to participate on this guide. Uh, these are people I've admired for a long time. These are national names. I mean, it was just really extraordinary that every one of these folks said yes. And when we assembled for the first time, one of their jobs was to come to the committee meeting with recommendations for what they thought were solid principles that teachers could follow in trying to improve problem solving in the classroom on a regular basis. Um, we worked through the different recommendations that they brought to the meeting. We distilled them down from something like 13 different recommendations, recommendations to seven. And then it's the job of a whole other organization to cull through all the research that exists. And we set parameters on this. We looked internationally. We ended up restricting it to grades four through eight. Uh, we looked through 3,700 research or idea pieces using the criteria of high-quality research, either correlational research, quasi-experimental, or experimental research is the basis for finding appropriate support for the recommendations. And as a function, had to go back and change some of these recommendations and their wording and content so they fit the actual data. The consequence is there's a substantive amount of empirical support for what then gets translated in the recommendations. The very same, same thing happened with the RTI guide, very, very similar process. And in the end, what you get, and this is what's really important, I want to underscore this more than anything else, both of these documents are highly readable documents. They're surprisingly short. 
uh, by all means, don't worry about the very end of the documents and their technical structure. You don't have to read through that. The main intention of these documents is to give professional development providers, your in-house math coaches, you name it, a launching pad to do in-services, talk about recommendation one, recommendation one, two, and three, however they want to configure it, but to use this as a basis for professional development and to be able to do it with the confidence that they are actually using research-based recommendations. So there's this really interesting irony for all the technical work that lies behind these documents, they're written in ways that are both brief, brief and seemingly surprisingly simple. Okay, so the general you know idea behind it is give people the recommendations, give them examples, give them roadblocks that teachers or principals or whomever will run into in implementing the recommendations and solutions for how to address those roadblocks. Do all that in a concise way that your everyday consumers can take advantage of. These are not technical, library-level, dense kinds of reports on these topics. So. Incredibly valuable, free, what more could you ask for? And you have two different ones that I'm going to now try to link together. Some of the recommendations that come out of each guide are, in fact, exactly the same. Uh, sometimes, in some cases, there's overlap. So let's just dive into each one. Um, in terms of the problem-solving guide, and you're going to have to keep this straight, the PSG is the problem-solving guide for grades 4 through 8. We'll refer to the other one as the RTI guide. These are for at-risk learners in grades 1 through 8. So for the problem-solving guide, there were five recommendations. The first one that's not up here, oddly enough, is one that has to do with instructional planning. And there's just not a lot of research that's done on instructional planning. So the panel has the uh, opportunity to include that recommendation in the guide, and their support for it is minimal. But for ones where we found strong levels of support, you can read what they are on the left. Helping kids monitor and reflect, use visual representations, this whole piece of multiple problem-solving strategies. Again, to go back to my time a couple weeks ago in Japan, I've been there on multiple occasions. If they do anything extremely well that we do extremely poorly, it's this having kids have the opportunity to see multiple solutions to a strategy or multiple strategies for solving a problem. I mean, it's an extraordinarily important principle, and you'll see an example of it when we get there in a little bit. And then this last piece, and I want to take a second to talk about what that means. It's help students recognize and articulate mathematical concepts and notations. So Sibylla Beckman, who's a world-class uh, you know, math educator at the University of Georgia. She was one of the readers for the Common Core Standards. She made the point in our panel that's really worth remembering. When you do problem solving well in a classroom and you get kids engaged and they work through a problem and you do number four, you get kids presenting different solution strategies for the problem, you think that's great and we're done. The point that she brought to the panel that's extremely important is you've got to connect it back to the notations and the concepts. Problem Problem-solving isn't over just because you've solved the problem. In times, it's incredibly critical, and again, you'll see an example of this at the very end where we show students the notation that relates to the problem. So important principles, nice thing is level of scientific evidence or support is both strong and moderate, and we're pretty pleased with that. There are guides. I think there's one on assessment practices for districts. There's seven recommendations, and they're all minimal level support. So this thing just doesn't naturally fall out. You're kind of lucky when this stuff happens. In terms of the RTI guide, so this was the second guide off to the right, struggling learners, grades one through eight, here are the two recommendations that we're going to start, we'll talk about in the context of this presentation. Instruction uh, on solving problems with a common un underlying structure. So in many respects, this goes to, for well, a lot of you probably are familiar with cognitively guided instruction. It's that kind of thinking. And in fact, there's a piece of cognitively guided instruction that's embedded in the back of the common core standards. When they talk about problem solving, they literally use the language of types of problems that CGI uses. 
And then once again, here's your overlap with the previous problem-solving guide. We talk about the importance of visual representations of math ideas. Something in my own experience, in my own work with a lot of low-achieving kids, which is kind of my area of specialty, I can't say enough about the importance of visual representations as a roadmap into understanding mathematical ideas. Absolutely critical and, 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 and very subtle in its own ways. And we'll get into examples of that in a little bit. All right, so now I'll go back to some connections. This is stuff that, again, you can look at later, but when we look at mathematical problem solving and reasoning from the Virginia standards level, here's where the math practices standards uh, from the Common Core connect, and here's where the problem solving recommendation IES guides uh, connect. So you've got the assisting, monitoring, reflecting, you've got the connecting, the concepts and notation, all that stuff that I just talked about. So again, you can refer to this later, but here's more of your connections. And we get to communication and representation and problem solving, again, you can see in some cases where um, you know, the recommendations from the problem solving guide are going to fit. And then uh, furthermore with the problem solving guide, math connections, this is common core standard stuff, and then the reflection again. This importance of the last recommendation, the problem solving guide, coming back, making sure kids see the connection between the problem solving and the notation turns out to be a hugely important practice. Okay, and now we'll switch to the RTI guide, mathematical reasoning. One of the basis of empirical support, especially for struggling learners, is to solve these problems with underlying structure, common underlying structure. And of course, the using visual representations again. So you can refer to this later. Let's get on uh, with examples. So the first example that I want to take on is this assisting students in monitoring and reflecting. This is, and I'm going to give you just an incredibly brief snippet of the kind of conversations we had with the panel as we developed this recommendation and we looked at research. I mean, how do we help make sense of the problem, develop persistence, assist kids without guiding them, give them assistance that actually is contextually sensitive and makes sense? These are all the challenges of assisting, monitoring, and reflecting. And, and by the words monitoring and reflecting, what we're talking about is even from the beginning stage of introducing a problem, as they work with problem, and then reflecting on their problem solving afterwards. So it covers the whole gamut of the problem solving process. So the general nature of the recommendation is you can go as far as, and this is a little bit of a blurring between the general ed world and the special ed world, where it may not be bad to have a list of prompts that help kids monitor and reflect. I mean, ultimately, you want them to internalize, it's very metacognitive, you want them to internalize a set of questions they can ask themselves in this process and how to reflect on things and monitor them, okay? And this is the ability that you want to develop. Okay, questions you can ask yourself. This is what we wanted to avoid, like the plague. Uh, that, and you see this in classrooms. People pull this from polia, right? You have this script. You know, in, in special ed research, particularly that I'm familiar with, you have this turned into acronyms, and they read the problem, find a strategy, solve the problem, evaluate it. Well, you know, kids can memorize this. They can recite this. But what you find with the research is it does very little to improve actual problem solving. It might be a nice little mnemonic or memory scheme, but especially find the strategy, make a drawing, it just doesn't pencil out as something that's very helpful. It has to be much more context bound than that. So here's what the kind of thing you find in the problem solving guide. The problem, you know, it's about what it's asking, information is given relevant information. This next to last one is huge, and I'm going to give you an actual example of this. Is the problem similar to problems I've previously solved? I was in an eighth grade classroom just a week ago, and I was working with these kids, and here's the problem. You can just sort of get it in a nutshell. It's George is, you know, doing homework problems, and he solved 25 of them. He solved them at the rate of three problems every five minutes. 
Now Lisa comes into the scene and she starts solving problems and she's solving them at the rate of seven problems every five minutes, okay? Now the question is at what point are they solving the same number of problems? Obviously not something that has any real world application because nobody ever does this, but that's aside from the point. The big deal is the context is solving homework problems. George is starting out having solved 25. He's solving at a different rate, a slower rate than Lisa solving it. Well, let me ask all of you, what kind of problem is that like? Well, it's definitely like the car starts out, it has a 60-mile lead, it's driving at 50 miles an hour, another car starts out uh, at you know, a different point in time going 70 miles an hour, at exactly what point in time are they the same distance? The value of a question like this is to help kids see the common underlying structure, the mathematics, as well as possibly provoke similar use of visual representations. So if this kind of question is asked at appropriate times, in the process of the problem solving, it's all that kids may need as a scaffold, and it keeps us a good distance away from just solving the problem for them. So uh, there's a lot to these questions, and Mark Driscoll, who's, who's on the panel, who has this lovely book on algebraic thinking, ironically, or not ironically, actually intelligently, he, in his book, presents a lot of these questions you can ask kids, and in his case, it's in the context of algebra. Can I predict the answer to this problem before I've finished all of my calculations? Again, all of these problems in the right context, the right topical area can be very, very helpful in, in helping kids reflect on the process, and they go a great distance further than that, read the problem, select a strategy, execute the strategy, and evaluate it. They're much more um, uh, context specific. So as, though, as much as it looks like just a list, it's the kind of stuff that can be really helpful in either getting kids started, getting them to change what they're doing. For example, if we continue this process, are we going to hit a dead end? Is it going to be fruitful or do we need to revise what we're doing? Those kinds of questions in a contextual way, very important to helping kids as they solve substantive problems. Here's the second example. So now we're going to the RTI guide. One of the things they found particularly important, especially for struggling learners, though I think you can make the claim easily, it's critical that kids in general do this, and that's the claim that cognitively guided instruction makes, finding the underlying structure. So you got problems like it's summer, my job's to weed the garden, I counted 45 weeds on Friday, I didn't do any work all weekend, now there's 72 weeds in the garden. The key thing about this problem is the question that's now going to get asked, how many more weeds grew in the garden? Well, we know that for young kids, that word more, or for struggling learners, that word more often means addition, and we want to use visual representations and manipulatives, perhaps in other contexts, to help kids see that in this case, more means less, and that you're doing this compare kind of problem. And as you find in the uh, Common Core Standards Appendix, and you find certainly at CGI, there are other problem types that kids need opportunities to, to, to solve in the area of subtraction. You have the separate type problems, you have the part, part, whole kinds of problems. These are all frameworks that kids can experience and then also contrast, right? So you have a set of problems that are not predictable end of chapter problems where you have a compare problem or some compare problems with with separate problems, so they have to sort of see them and see different strategies and see the underlying structures that are different. And this is something that's pretty well articulated in the uh, RTI guide. In terms of example three, visual representations, now this is going to come right out of um, uh, the common course uh, standards at the middle grades. They talk about ratios and proportions. You've got a typical thing like this, three apples, two dollars, how much you pay for twelve dollars. Well, equivalent fraction models, cross multiplication works. They don't work so well, excuse me, they don't work so well when you have unfriendly numbers like five for two dollars, how much would you pay for nine? The Common Core Standards call for the use of tables, for double number lines, for tape diagrams. This is an example of tables where the double bang you get for your buck is they get number sense development. So I think of friendly numbers, 5 to 45, 
is 9 times. Now divide it back by 5, I get 9. I can do the same thing with $2 times 9, divide it back by 5. The visual representations are a huge way of helping kids make sense of um, problems in this fashion. Okay, and so, and again, explicitly recommended in the Common Core. To go to a fourth example, multiple problem-solving strategies, and I notice I'm starting to run a little close on time, so you folks sitting out there are off the hook. Here comes a problem. I'm going to give you just a second to think about it. It comes directly from the problem-solving guide. You will see this problem in the guide. And usually when I do this, I have people take a second, talk to each other. I don't want them to solve the problem per se, but to think about how would you would solve it. Here's the point of the exercise. It's a challenging problem for a lot of kids, especially if they haven't gotten to parallel lines and transversals. There are ways you'll see in a second where you don't need to have that knowledge to solve it. But the big deal is you get done with one solution, say, wow, I solved the problem. This is great. I'm all done. There can't be another solution to this problem. Well, let's just look at, say, six solutions to this problem. First solution is, well, you extend the line, you have a transversal, right? And then you use your supplementary angle knowledge. You know that you combine, you know, the sum of interior angles for a triangle. We're always going to add to 180, so that makes the piece that's missing 85. You get a supplementary angle again. You solve the problem, you get 95. That's great. Solution one. Solution two is, well, gosh, if I do a perpendicular line, I can create two triangles. I can, again, infer this information, right, in terms of interior angles. So I've got 90 degrees and 70 degrees and 20 degrees for the interior angles of the triangle down below. That's the way I get 20. I can get 65 up above. That's a straight line. It's 180. That's how we get 95. That's how we can use a vertical line to create two triangles. But we can also create a quadrilateral. We know the sum of the interior angles of the quadrilateral is going to be 360 degrees, and apply the same kind of logic, right? We've taken that 155-degree angle up on top. We've partitioned it into 90 and 65. There goes our solution. Off it goes. Well, you like quadrilaterals? We can make... Pent uh, <coughs> pentagons, okay? So we've got pentagons where we've got 90, 90, 155, and we know that the interior sum of angles is 540 degrees. We've got 445. We find 95 that way. We can just take and do symmetry, right? We can take this angled pair of line segments. We can, you know, um, reflect them symmetrically. We can figure out the math that way. Okay, and we can end up finding that 95 degrees is X, 190 is going to be our sum divided by 2 to get 95. Last but not least, we can do two cross transversals. We can figure out all that information down below, and then we can ask the question, gee, if you have a circle, that's what the blue circle is all about. The sum of the interior angles is going to be 360 degrees, and there you go. Now, a whole bunch of these solutions, well, there's one more, but all these solutions are stuff that never would occur to kids, or they're solutions that might be appropriate to a specific context, as this one is for working with circles in a very sort of uh, wide a field kind of challenging problem. Last but not least, you got parallel lines. Well, you can draw another parallel line so that now you have two different transversals. You use your alternative interior angle information, and voila, you have 25 and 70 as your measures of your angles, and add them together, and you got 95. Lots of different ways to see that sort of thing. And now I'm coming up, and I'm a little bit into the time for question and answer, so let me just finish this off quickly. To come back to this recommendation five that I said is very, very important, here's an example from a seventh grade classroom. Okay, cold day in the North Pole, 17 below zero, warms up to 13, what a lovely day. What's the temperature change? Well, kids use visual recommendation, representations, which is great. They use number lines, but they use the number lines in this way. Negative 17 is off the left, 13 is off to the right. We'll just add up, right? We'll do 17, 13, that's 30 degree change. Answer's correct, but we can think about it in this particular context because we're working with subtracting negative numbers, and it's important to see that kind of representation, that kind of notation associated with what it means to subtract negative numbers 
so they see the connection, all right? Otherwise, it would have been missed on kids, and you spend all this time doing subtracting, dating numbers. You actually find an example where it can work, and then you miss the notation, and that's the whole point there. So last few comments before we get to the Q&A. It's stuff that we couldn't answer was how long, how many times per week. That's just something we want it to be a disposition when we think about problem solving in the classroom. Some curriculum, a lot easier than others. Sometimes the task isn't as huge as people think. If you find the average of those six numbers, six, eight, four, nine, five, ten, well, give me the same average with six more numbers, one of which is 14. That's moved a relatively routine averaging task up to a higher level problem solving task. And that's why instructional planning is really key. And I'd talk more about that if we had time. That was our first recommendation. The last thing I want to say before the Q&A, there's a brand new uh, math IES guide, what works in math, the evidence for grades K through five. Really nice. I've had a chance to look at it. This is now just recently available for um, uh, downloading. Uh, it's on the IES website as well. So I'm going to stop there. I'm a little bit over time, and I want to afford time for questions and answers. And I think, Lodota, you're the one who's uh, going to distill those. Yes. Yes. Thank you, John. Um, at this point, we would like to um, turn the webinar over to our participants and ask you to please type in any questions that you have. Um, in the Q&A boxes. Um, we do have one question, John, that has been entered, and the question is in regard to special ed, which I know you touched on um, briefly, but the question is whether or not the recommendations can be applied to special ed students 9 through 12 that are currently learning 4 through 8 mathematical content. Absolutely. There's no question about it. Um, in fact, I would say that the comment I would make about secondary special ed kids or secondary education is this kind of thing is more important than any other place. I mean, we know the crush of content that kids experience. And I think for the special ed audience at the 9 through 12 level to answer this question, it's the kind of thing that can make math much more engaging to kids. We know that often the special ed kids are kind of caught in this catch-up skills race and they're not given the opportunity to do the problem solving uh, that they need to do that's important for the kinds of assessments we're going to see in the future and just for the kinds of things that makes instruction far more uh, engaging to them. So absolutely, they do apply. We just were, we were bracketed by four through eight simply because that was the domain or grade levels of research that we looked at. Okay. Um, we are waiting for other questions. Um, here's another one, John. Um, you mentioned Singapore math. Is this a good direction to go as far as giving students strategies to solve a problem? And if not, what do you suggest? Well, I think one of the things, and, and this is, I mean, it's a great question. I think it's really important for educational reasons for everybody to digest this. When you use these two words, Singapore math, um, what I think goes through most people's mind, if they're at all, you know, knowledgeable of math education and the math community, is that curriculum that I think, you know, it's now sold on a website. Um, the real truth about Singapore math are two things that are incredibly important for people to understand. First of all, Singapore has moved, if you go to what they've done from 19, say, 70 to 2014, they've moved through phases. The phase that a lot of people mostly associate the Singapore math with is something that they did 15 years ago when they created math materials. The thing that's also problematic for the American audience is their curriculum materials are incredibly thin, incredibly narrow. That means they rely on teaching much more than curriculum to be effective. And then the third thing about this that's critical is that they've moved beyond the curriculum. It's all about, all about problem solving, and it's more about pedagogy or process than it is anything that's embedded in a specific uh, curriculum book in Singapore. So it's better to actually stick with the stuff we have in the guides than anything else. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Pam, for the question. Another question, are there some curriculum that provide better examples or possible problems to practice problem solving than others? 
And then are there interventions that are more effective than others to accelerate learning in this area? It's a really great question. I'll tell you what a lot of people are doing at this time. It's 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 kind of a challenging cut and paste. It's more challenging for elementary school teachers than it, uh, my experience is than middle school or secondary teachers who have a greater experience with the math content. But you know we've seen the sea change go back and forth. In the 1990s, we saw all these curriculum materials that came out of. Um, National Science Foundation that followed venues like Investigations, Everyday Math, the Connected Math Program, the Intera Interactive Math Program. They were all incredibly problem-solving based, and now that we've swung back the other direction, people want to see a lot more attention to algorithms and you know computational procedures and those sort of things. And I'm not taking an opinion one side or the other, but what effective teachers do they're able to draw on some of these materials from the 1990 to provide, and here's the key part, relevant problem solving. It's not just pulling out of a book, hey, that'd be a real good problem to give to kids today. The key thing, and this has to do with instructional planning, finding the problem solving that's relevant to the topic. And that takes a lot of time in searching through the materials. But I think I said from the outset, so, or you know, at some point, the, there's some curriculum materials that are much more amenable to, the, uh, to others. The ones that are tough to do are those very traditional procedural curriculum. You see this a lot with special ed kids. So you've got to draw on other materials that's been created. NCTM has umpteen amounts of them. This is one of the issues that we tried to, to address was in both through you know, consulting with math consultants, with stuff that's on the web, through the NCTM and all that. There's a wealth of problem-solving materials out there. It's incumbent upon teachers to really be specific and intentional in incorporating those problems into practice so that it's relevant and it's not just one of these problem-for-the-day kind of things. All right, thank you, and thanks to everyone for these questions. We do have another question. What role does creative thinking have in mathematical problem solving? Well, that's easy to answer, everything. I mean, that's one of this kind of lateral thinking or creative thinking, uh, especially, and, you know, and actually I'll, I'll take you, it's a real textured question when you think about it. Creative thinking often comes on the part of kids in ways where it's done and difficult to articulate. That's, again, one of the aspects of teaching problem solving is teachers have to be very good at what is often called uh, talk moves. They have to be able to revoice and take the creative process, outcomes, strategies, or whatever it is, and make it visible to other kids in the class. So for sure, creative alternatives or different ways of thinking about it, you saw a little bit of that in the parallel line transversal. I mean, there's incredibly creative solutions to that problem once you start working on that. Well, gosh, if I can do it with a triangle, I can do it with a quadrilateral, I can do this with, you know, a, a Pentang, uh, Pentagon, I'm sorry, I can do this with, uh, you know, reflecting line. There's really creative solutions there, so it's everything. All right, another question, John. I guess, you know, I'm just thinking as a former math teacher, I mean, I always enjoy your comments, and I think that your remarks and the information found in the practice guides are, you know, just so helpful to us as we try to really apply these things in the classroom. Um, and I guess, you know, that I'm, I'm thinking about how you've connected the NCTM to the Common Core to the Virginia Standards of Learning and talked to us about, you know, relevant problem solving and how important that is. I guess a question for you would be, you know, as a participant in this webinar, someone that's in the classroom really trying to determine how to apply these things, you know, we have evidence, we have recommendations, I mean, can you advise or recommend to those of us that are in the classroom really trying to implement this, like, how would you suggest we start? Because it could seem overwhelming, even though, as you've said, that the guide is short, it's an easy read, and it's extremely right. helpful. Do you have advice of, you know, where we could start to really begin to implement some of the things that you've talked about today? Right, you know, and that's great, and and I I think I can give you I hope I can give you a relatively concise uh, framework. But what immediately comes to mind is this, and I'll, I'll tell you the, the the typical response to the question that you're asking. The typical response is I got to go find a curriculum. Another typical response is to learn how to do this I got to go get coaching. Right. 
Well, one of the things that we found, and this is a long haul, but it's short of just jumping into a curriculum or short of coaching, we really strongly recommend the understanding by design framework for helping teachers think about how they plan for lessons. So one way to go about doing this is, and the, the brilliance, there are many brilliant dimensions. I could go on for two hours about understanding by design, but one of the brilliant things was start with the standards, and as you work down, work on a unit of instruction, not a lesson, a unit of instruction. And one of the first ways to get going on this whatever curricular materials you have, try to build into a unit of instruction two or three opportunities over the course of, say, two weeks or three weeks where kids have the opportunity to do a deep dive on some challenging problems, okay? Start small, you know, work on the kind of practices that go into it, plan it intentionally, make sure that problem solving connects to whatever the topics they happen to do. So you do in subtraction of negative numbers, right? Well, working through a problem like we did, using the number line and spending the time to set it up, get kids to talk about it like the problem solving guide recommends, that's kind of the way to go about it. Otherwise, it's intimidating, this idea that we just sort of jump into it, we do problem solving all the time. Nobody's going to do that. That's why we failed. We've got to start small and plan around it. And one of the big recommendations I would make is afford that time across a unit. Say a week from now on Wednesday and possibly spilling into Thursday, we're going to do a long, challenging problem. Another way to go at it is if they're brand new to things, they could do three or four smaller scale problems so they get used to like how to use that table in a ratios and proportion problem. That's problem solving too. But start small, plan it intentionally, and then kind of work from there. Okay, thank you. And one last um, question or just a request to, to maybe elaborate a little bit, John. Um, as I mentioned, I know that you shared with us the importance of relevant problem solving. And for those of us that have had the opportunity to work with you in the past, um, you've pointed out um, on other webinars, the importance of culturally appropriate questions, and I think that certainly ties to the relevance piece, but I wondered if you might um, just share a little bit about the culturally appropriate um, Sure, right. I'm glad you brought that up, and I think I talked about it incredibly briefly in the presentation. The first recommendation that was in the problem-solving guide that you can see, and there's more detail there, uh, it was all about planning. But in planning, we've got to take into account, obviously, who the students are who are in front of us. And one of the panel members, Philip, Philip uh, Agboe, if I can pronounce his name correctly, is from the L.A. Unified School District. Well, I don't need to say anything more. That is an incredibly you know, uh, a diverse district with many kind of kids, many kids who are immigrants, to tailor problem solving so it fits their background, so it fits their context, to fit their experiences. And sometimes it's just a wording change. One of the things we've found in the research is if you could change the name of the characters in the word problem to people they know, the principal, the teacher, whomever, another kid in the class, that made difference to kids, but also to control the vocabulary, and this is something that applies to special ed kids kids to create the context so it's something that they've seen before, so you're drawing on their own experience. That cultural competence piece is an enormous part of because the way, you know, when people write problems in a curriculum, they're strapped by the fact that this thing can go any place to anybody. They can't, you know, diversify the problems. And that's where the teachers have a role of, of changing the problems and rewriting them in some fashion so that they're more culturally congruent with kids. Okay, thank you. I think probably and if you were at Tyson's Corner in uh, uh, Virginia, I think you know exactly what I mean. Yes, thank you, John. And yeah. one last question very quickly, and then I would like to just give our closing remarks and ask our participants to complete our stakeholder feedback survey. But one other question came in, um, the fact that analyzing work on the weakest point for um, my students, they know the concepts, but how to come up with a solution is what they're lacking. Okay. Uh, one of the great things that came out of the problem solving guide, and if we're getting to uh, analyzing, okay, analyzing the word problem is fairly weak. There's a lot of restating, revoicing, those kinds of things up front that 
you know, if we spend time on that process, and if we also solicit from students the interpretations of not only what the problem means, having it restated, but how we might think about getting it started, it's really oftentimes a matter of slowing down what is, I mean, when I did a lot of the research with low achieving kids, the number one, two, three, four thing that just came up as a strategy was kids would blow right over what is the problem asking for, right? So asking all those questions that come into that monitoring recommendation, recommendation two from the problem solving guide, that's huge and that's all right there and you talk about the problem, introduce the problem, make sure the context is all clear. You spend a lot more time on that than you normally do and certainly it's something that stands outside of, well, here are a list of problems, you solve them. I mean, you take time to actually work them in class. Okay, thank you. And sure. with that, I would like to um, thank Dr. Woodward for his um, wonderful comments today. I think they are so helpful and so meaningful to the work that we're doing in our middle school classrooms mm -hmm. in mathematics. And also, I'd like to thank all of the participants for joining us today. We know that your time is precious and that you are very busy and on behalf of Braille Appalachia we would like to thank you for spending an hour with us to learn more about problem solving at the middle school level. We do want you um, to share your thoughts on this webinar. This is extremely important to us and um, really vital to our continuation of our webinars. So when you leave the webinar you will be directed to a link that um, have, we'll have a few questions and we just ask that you take a very short time and answer these questions so that we know what you think about the webinar, um, what, you know, so that we can make improvements for future events. Again, we appreciate your time today. Thank you for being with us. Again, thank you to Dr. Woodward. And we look forward to um, hearing your comments and seeing your comments on the survey. This event has been recorded and it will be available to you if you would like to listen again to specific parts and see the slides, um, those will be made available to you as well. So thank you again. Please take the time to fill out the survey and we look forward to working with you on a webinar in the future.